So let me introduce, well, do join us. <laughs> we'll carry on outside. Great to see people coming in. Um, let me introduce down the end of the line there, Solitaire Townsend from Futera, who is, if you've seen her on YouTube, Ted, absolute expert communicator on the climate challenge. Next to her, Arlo Brady, CEO of the Freud's Group, professional communicator, extraordinaire. And beside me here, Eleanor Doms, who's got the brilliant tagline on social media of being born in the Arctic. You're a child of climate change. Um, and you also do fantastic work uh, on social media, which we're going to talk more about. Um, I'll introduce myself, actually. So I was for 38 yeah. years a BBC correspondent. And um, for the last 20, I focused on climate change, sustainability, the rise of renewables, the science. And every day in the newsroom of the BBC, we confronted the issue of how to convey how urgent this problem is. Because if you read the science or read of the science, we have 80 months, eight zero months from now, to halve global emissions. 80 months to halve global emissions if we're to avoid the very worst rises in temperature that could otherwise be in store for us. And we all know how bad it is on a planet that's 1.2 degrees hotter than it was before the industrial age. We're on course for a number that's much, much bigger. So how do we, how do we overcome that? Let's get a quick hit from everybody first about when you think of how am I going to convince people? How do I convey this? What kind of language you use? How do you do that task? Solitaire, kick us off with just what's, what's burning on your mind and what you want to get over with. Let's start with a really small question. How do you communicate climate change? Thank you very much for that. <laughs> um, so, of course, we can go into the uh, rules of how you do communications, which is it would change depending on who you were talking to. And it's all about what they need rather than what you want to say. So target your audience. Target your audience always. But I think we've got two things going on at the moment. One is movement making and trying to make sure that there is a big enough mandate for change from the public for everything that everyone in this room is trying to do. And then secondly is marketing. And for me, that means selling the solutions. I am sick of talking about the problem of the urgency. It is there, but climate change is now communicating itself. It has taken over the job from wild weather to extreme events. It has a bigger communications budget than any of us have. It's the solutions that need our storytelling now. Okay, well, we'll definitely get into that. Arlo, what's on your mind when you think of this question? Well, I was going to say one thing first, which is that you introduced yourself. <laughs> and what we should say is there are very few people, in my opinion, in the UK anyway, that have had a greater contribution well, thank you. to commu communicating the challenge. Thank of you very much. Give the guy a round of applause. He's, okay. he's, well, thank he, you. he's announced as a veteran on the, <laughs> on the screen in the introduction. It's years and years of, com of, of hard work on the BBC of, of explaining what climate change is about. Well, I am blushing. Made him blush. Yeah. I don't blush very often. I'll give you the fiver later, Ollie. Thank you. Yeah, thank Excellent. You. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's the, that, that's the but, yeah. but that, as you say, that job, I think, has largely been done now. I mean, if you do focus groups as, as we do up and down the country and across the world every day, people do know what that climate change is happening and, and, yeah, and, and they, they know what it is. They, they get it because they're experiencing it more now, like with the heat wave last summer, or they're hearing about it. Well, that's one component, it. part of it. I think yeah. there's a whole myriad of different reasons why people understand what it is, yeah. not least because certain parts of the media have been talking yeah. about it and introducing it into conventional society through TV programs and all sorts of things and sure. films over the years and over years and years. Because let's face it, we've known about this challenge that we're talking about, this urgent challenge that we're talking about for actually donkey's years. I remember my dad gave me a book when I was, he was a bit of a campaigner, but he gave me a book when I was quite small from the Club of Rome. I can't even remember what it was called now with lots of nasty yeah. graphs on it showing that the world was going to hell in a handbasket. So we've known for a long time. For me, the biggest challenge in this space is the fact that most of the people doing the communicating about the behavior change that we need are people who have a 
deeply held philosophical belief set about this space and aren't able to step out of their own shoes and into someone else's shoes and think about what might motivate them to do something differently. And that's what's, for me, what's so, wrong in this space. So that means that those believers, as it were, might not target the audience that Solitaire is talking that's about. Exactly what she, yeah. That's exactly okay. what she's okay. saying. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think, think. Eleanor, when you think of urgency, and trying to cut through to people who aren't believers, who don't get it for whatever reason. What runs through your mind? Well, for me, it's the language that I use when communicating. And that's something that I experienced for years and something I had to change. Uh, when I just got my degree in energy and climate, the way I was communicating was, well, I have a degree. I know the science. We are really running out of time. We have to do something. We are not doing anything. Let's do something right now. And that was not going through. I love that energy, by the way, yeah, keep that going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then I switched, and now I, I go into storytelling more to show my point of view. Um, as, as you've mentioned, I was born and raised in the Arctic, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, my home city is quite big, it's 300,000 people, and it's located on the riverside. The river is about two kilometers wide, and it splits the city into two parts. One is a city center, another one is isolated villages. And I grew up in the city center side, but people from the villages, they have to cross this river every day to go to work or to go to school. And there are no bridges in between. So in summer, you can take a boat and in winter, you literally walk on ice. And that doesn't mean walking on ice anywhere. That means that authorities establish a special road on ice when the ice gets about 40 centimeters thick and you can walk and you can even drive a car on that road. Now, when I was a kid, the Arctic used to be very cold. We were used to minus 30 degrees for a couple of months, uh, but now it's not the case anymore. I was actually shocked to learn that in my home city, minus 30 is now considered abnormal officially. The average temperatures are minus 7, minus 10, and then sometimes in December or January, they're even above zero. So the river doesn't freeze? The river doesn't freeze, so they cannot install this road. And during the pandemic, it was installed one or two months later. So shops were running out of food on the other side. People were isolated. And patients that had to be admitted to the hospitals, they had really hard time getting there in the first place. And not just winters in the Arctic are changing, the summers are changing too. So for example, when there was this really bad year of floods in, in Europe, uh, and it was not hot weather, it was raining constantly. In my home city, it was plus 30 for two months with no rain. In the Arctic, it was hotter than here. My mom said she hasn't seen anything like this before. And that has profound consequences because the Arctic and the subarctic is home to boreal forests. And they are the world's largest carbon sink on land. They store 11% of carbon and they start releasing it and burning it in the Arctic. And the same happens for, for the Arctic ice. It, instead of reflecting solar radiation, it melts, it opens the dark sea, and it absorbs it and heats even more. So are you finding then in your dialogues with people that if you, if you tell that story of shops running out of food because the river didn't freeze, that that kind of makes more sense for an audience outside the Arctic, let's say, than showing a graph or talking about numbers? I feel that human story cuts through more. I feel it does because it gets personal. I am witnessing my home melt away. I can share that story, but then I connect it to the graph and the tipping points. And most of the climate tipping points, they're located in the Arctic, in the polar regions or next to them. So that shows how what's happening in the Arctic is really close to us because it regulates the whole ecosystem on Earth. And if Arctic and the Antarctica go out of balance, our whole ecosystem on Earth goes out of balance. So, Arlo, in your experience, do you, do you find that it, it is all about the story? I mean, to what extent is that the key driver here, to find a narrative that people can connect with? I think it entirely depends on who the audience is, to, to Solly's point earlier. I mean, for me, what you're describing motivates me and makes me upset, and if my kids heard it, it would motivate. But it wouldn't motivate quite a lot of people in the developed world, and you know, one. And therefore, we need to find alter alternative sto stories, nevertheless, but alternative stories. One of the slight obsessions I have is that there isn't really in existence a populist narrative for climate action, and most of the world today is dominated by populist politics 
most narratives for climate action are center left really um and i think that there's a big opportunity you know people would be in the, at the moment in the uk for example talking about migration relating to these kinds of events might be more of a motivating storyline than talking about the event itself and the uh, unfortunately and the people that might be struggling as a result of it i mean if there's another way in the context of here to pivot to talking about opportunities for business Yes, might be another absolutely. way in finding shining examples that uh, that do that. So, is it you were nodding during Arlo's point there? So, um, I recently joined the advisory board of the Hollywood Climate Summit. So, the wow. Hollywood Climate Summit is all of the big uh, Hollywood studios, you know, the Netflixes, the NBCs. BBC and others are part of it. But what was so interesting was watching them all fall asleep when you talk about climate change, because it's not a story. And Nobody's is... falling asleep here, yeah. obviously. <laughs> exactly. Right, yeah. Well, this is a group. Yeah. We, we're weird. In this room, we are weird and we're unusual. We get it. We're motivated. We're already there. It's 2023. Everybody who's like us is already motivated. We don't need to reach any of the like-minded people anymore. We've got to reach the other groups, the other target groups. And sitting with all of these Hollywood filmmakers, it was stories. That was all they wanted to hear was anecdotes. And, and they were extremely aware of the power that they had. And so I went away and I did a little bit of research on the fact that human beings believe anecdotes more than we believe facts. Now, I had to do quite a lot of research on that because I decided, I, it wasn't that I disbelieved it, that, because it's science, I just don't want it to be true. I actually want people to be motivated and believe facts. But someone who tells you an anecdote about something is more to be believed. And just imagine, you're at the water cooler, you're telling somebody about the electric car you're going to buy, that you've researched, that you've done hours on Google, looking at miles per hour and carbon, and yet someone who you work with who you don't even like very much says, oh, you don't want to buy that, mate. My cousin's uncle brother, so much, so <laughs> many um, hidden costs, hidden yeah. costs. All the evidence would show that you won't buy the car, even though you have the proof that it's the right car to do. So what we need is we need to get this mountain of stories, anecdotes, proof points, human um, interest, you, your stories of being entrepreneurs against the odds. We've got to get these embedded across pop culture so that we get, as Arlo said, these narratives that people can hang on to. Because the only narrative that there is at the moment out there is the we're fucked narrative. Mm. That's the narrative. Um, and it's, pop, it's, I'm not challenging that narrative. I read the IPCC reports. The we're fucked narrative mm. is very, very serious. That's a scientific term, by the Ex way. Exactly. But we also need, and here's yeah. another scientific yeah. term, we need a how do we unfuck it yeah. narrative as well. We need that solution That's in the annex. story. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We need those. I need as many powerful narratives, as powerful as Elena just said about the problem, I need as many powerful narratives about the solution and anecdotes in order to be able to create that movement and that mandate. So look, I think... And I, uh, sorry, oh, yeah, yeah, I build yeah. on that. And I think those narratives need to come from people, unusual people that are closer to the point of change in the sense that using the example of the electric car that we do a lot of uh, public health campaigning and if you look at the behavior change work we do on public health particularly the the work that we did during the pandemic on vaccines you'll see that most people are actually influenced by we're unusual in that we're probably influenced by david on the tv talking to a scientist and showing a graph but actually most normal people are influenced by a bloke they met in the pub. or and, and it, So we need to find a way of getting closer to where people are actually receiving their information. And the environment movement hasn't done a very good job of that historically. Yeah. So look, I think one of the issues that's, that's really a big one for me is language. I mean, yeah. climate, I mean, net zero. A lot Lovely of people term. don't really know what it means, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I found that all the time. Uh, mitigation, adaptation, so, I mean, ambition, IPCC, UNFCCC. I mean, I heard a horrifying story the other day from a friend who's a, uh, on the board of a medium-sized European bank that I will not name unless I trip up. 
Um, and they, the board, had to go, had to go through a two-hour ESG training module uh, that was given by someone from one of the big four accountancy firms. And my friend said it was an absolute disaster. Yeah. Because not only was it boring, it was complicated. It had the 40 slides, a 40 yes. slide deck in a two hour session with wiring diagrams. But if you think about it, right, if you, I think this yeah, ur urgency yeah. of the challenge, yeah. right? If you had an urgent challenge yeah. and you wanted to get lots of people in, we, we need lots of people involved, right? Would you make it super yeah. complicated well, or no, that's make right. it super So the chairman of the bank erupted and said, I want something simpler. Can't you just give me, and, I, and my friend sent me the deck and I was horrified because it was impossible to, I mean, he, you know, I know this stuff and I found yeah. it boring just reading it through quickly. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, the prof I think the profound implication is that at the end of it, my friend said, none of the board wanted to engage with this topic ever again. Yeah. In fact, they were positively hostile to this green yeah. crap. Mm. Now, yeah. okay, that seems to me partly a language yeah. problem. Eleanor, you, you, you talk very graphically about the river and the shops and, and you know, your childhood and so forth. But you also did slip into a little bit. We all do. We all do. How do you avoid the language, the terrible language of this field, knowing how off-putting it is? Well, I think it's even on top of the language, right? We have the language of communicating the knowledge. We have the super big complexity of regulation that is getting more complex every day. And we have a whole vastness of solutions that all need to be implemented for a change. And I think sometimes it's just nightmare to navigate through that for anyone. And that's why we need the simplicity of that knowledge and the simplicity of solutions because people are so busy. We are all the time running, thinking how to provide for our households, what to do next. Um, and for me, I try to simplify the message for the others. Uh, for example, every Friday I record a one minute video on what's new in sustainability. I look through all the news and then I just say it very it's, simply. It's really nice, minute. by the way. T yeah. Tune in to Eleanor on, on social media. Thank Subscribe. you. Subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that's important. And I know people tell that they look for that every Friday. And these people, they work for companies, they work for governments because that helps them. So if we can help simplify first the education and then the second, the solution in terms of the action, what Solitaire mentioned that we need to, to know how to get it all unfucked. Mm. Well, we need to simplify those solutions as well. We need to help companies. We need to help, uh, help people and to say, look, we will do it for you in a very simple way. Or this is what you need to do, one, two, three. The terminology can be, well, is a barrier, isn't it? I mean, I remember going on the Today program at the premier slot of 10 past eight, and the, the presenter, it was about the IPCC, and the presenter introduced me, so oh, we've got our science editor joining us now, who's going to talk about this new report on 1.5%. Mm -hmm. And I thought, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, come on, it's 1.5%. Degrees Celsius. Uh, I had to correct yes. him on air. Yeah. Now, I yeah. mean, he's a bright guy. Yeah. So, so how do you confront this? So, um, we we really pick our terminology, don't don't we? Like from when carbon neutral, which now has got loads of question marks over it, but those are two terrible words to put together. And now we decided, no, let's upgrade that to net zero. Mm. Two other terrible words. Um, I do sessions with boards. And I call it sex ed for sustainability, because just like all sex ed, <laughs> if you get it right, it can be brilliant. Yeah. And if you get it wrong, there are serious consequences. And I go and I do these sessions, but mainly as I can see people taking notes about that. Exactly, sex ed for sustainability. Yeah. And what I, what I find is that when you work with senior leaders, number one, there's a great deal of confusion and misunderstanding about what these terms mean, what they stand for, even from companies that have made major commitments and even from leaders who have made big speeches. I had a CEO after working through what 1.5 mean goes, so basically we're going to lose and we're only going to lose by 1.5 degrees. He hadn't quite understood yeah. that 1.5 that we're putting forward is this massive win is actually just a management of the loss. And then you also confront some of the real challenges. When I work, work with boards, the, yeah, the consumer says they care about this, but they don't actually buy on it. 
yes, investors say they care, but I've never been asked in an investor meeting. You actually have to draw out those myths that people feel about sustainability and confront them straightforward. And then you also have to give people the validity to say, how are we going to make a buttload of money out of this? So when you're working, that's about targeting businesses. When you're working with businesses and where people are in their business mindset, where they have a job to do and they are judged on how well they do that job, you have to show how this is going to contribute to them doing that job well. If they want to talk about the urgency and terror of climate change, I tell them, go home and talk to your kids. They will tell you how bad this is and they will, they'll grab your heart. I need to grab your head. Arlo, what's your sense when you're engaging with the businesses that you work with? Many of them are progressive on this, aren't they? But to what extent do people get it? Do they understand it? How do you confront the issue of language when you're advising them on their communications? Well, I think there's, a, I mean, there's an undeniable fact that this space, that climate change is a bit complicated. I, I, you know, I, I know a little bit about climate change and if, if I, I'm sure there are some experts on climate in the audience here, and I'd be out of my depth within five minutes of a conversation, partly because of the terminology possibly, but also just by the fact that it's complicated and that's not my day job. So I think that there, there, it is important for us to try and simplify as much as we humanly can. And there are people who are quite good at that in the yeah. comms world. So I think you know we need to make sure that we're yeah. using the right yeah. people, not you know, getting the right people in, but quite a lot of those people don't know much about sustainability. There's a the earlier one of the earlier panels I was listening to talked about a skills gap. There is a skills gap in the comms and marketing world. You could argue that's a contributory factor to greenwash, for example. Yeah. Well, we'll come um, on to that. We're definitely I'm want sure. to explore that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The other, yeah. so we'll come on to that later. But the other thing I wanted to say about simplicity is that I think that it's it provides. Less, I often think people are using complexity in order to hide. Sure. If you come out with a sort of load of babble about climate change, mm. it takes quite a brave person to confront, mm. confront you and say, well, that, well, that's not really correct, is it? And yeah. If you're being really simple, it's much easier to, to, to spot bullshit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I'm a big fan of simplicity yeah. because there's less space to hide. Yeah, yeah, because actually you've got to be honest and open about what you know and what you don't know and find some kind of simple... Well, let's do greenwash. You brought it up. I was saving it for later, but let's tackle it. I mean, you know, in the, I think, extremely welcome tsunami of corporate engagement with climate change, which is relatively recent. I mean, the first COP I went to was COP number 11 in 2005. I don't remember many corporates being there. And so it's incredible to get to Glasgow and see an utter transformation and for an event like this to be taking place, unimaginable even a few years ago. But in with that welcome tsunami of corporate engagement has come a kind of sub-tsunami of greenwash, because an awful lot of people yeah. um, think that they want to look like they're doing the right thing, but don't. So that's another kind of communications challenge, because in a way, arguably, it distracts from the urgency. If people are saying in a rather bullshitty kind of way, oh, yeah, we're using less plastic or we're carbon neutral or whatever, um, it's, a, it's a massive green herring, I suppose, <laughs> or, it's a, or whatever. So I just thought of that and it's not very good. All right, no, cancel I'm, that. I'm going to run with it, green yeah. herring. So the Competition and Markets Authority here in the UK um, did an analysis and said 50% of the green claims that they analysed were technically greenwash. These were, these were ads, were they? Press releases, um, uh, whatever? Primarily yeah, ads. Right. So uh, uh, press releases are a little bit um, more difficult in terms of whose yeah. auspices they come under. Advertising comes under the, the Advertising Standards Authority. So if 50% is misleading, we've got a problem. Now, a certain percentage of that is malicious. It is deliberately attempting to uh, manipulate public views, usually of, an in, of a particular industry. And I have to say, oil and gas is particularly bad at that. Most greenwash is not malicious. It's enthusiastic marketers 
who have found something that motivates them as opposed to what they mainly do in their <laughs> job um, are desperate to get this message out there because it makes them proud and excited. Is that like sticking a picture of a little child holding planet Earth on the website or is it making a claim? Claims. Okay. Yeah. So you can greenwash in, uh, it's a little bit like breaking the law. You can break the, law, the spirit of the law and the letter of the law. You can greenwash in spirit and greenwash in, um, in fact. And if you greenwash in fact, it means you're breaking things like the Green Claims Code here in the UK. Yeah. The Advertising Standards Authority has the right to pull your advert. But for the public who don't carry around what the law of greenwash is, actually greenwash in spirit can be just as bad. Slapping a whole load of green imagery on something, trees and wind turbines, etc., when actually what you do doesn't, doesn't live up to it. Now, we know we've got more rules coming down the line, which are going to get rid of terms such as natural and green. Those will be more difficult. Um, but what we don't want to do is terrify everyone so much that they stop talking about this. So the rules of the rule, the way to avoid greenwash is the same way to avoid any type of misleading marketing, which is stop talking about yourself. Stop talking about yourself. Stop claiming what you're doing and start explaining how you're helping. And just that mindset change, we work with marketeers on this to say, take the word claims out and start thinking about offers of how you're helping people to make a difference. And as soon as you do that, there's a humility that comes with it where you'll stop boasting about yourself, which no one gives a shit about anyway. There isn't so a consumer you, on the planet that's going to go, well done. Communicate what you're done. actually doing. So talk about, or, or, or talk about the issues that matter to your consumer and to your, and to your customer and how you are going to help your customer with what they care about rather than what you've done, cared about. 90% of the claims that people make, be they greenwash or not, mm. don't need to be in the marketplace anyway. You do not have to talk about everything that you do. Mm. There are many, many other reasons to do sustainability rather than marketing them. And the only messages that should be out there are how you are serving your customer or your consumer and their needs on sustainability. And as soon as you do that, suddenly a lot of the greenwash drops away. And of course, it does matter, Eleanor, doesn't it? Because you know, the more greenwashing happens, the less we're actually getting on with the task of tackling climate change. I want to chip in on something that Solitaire said about sometimes we are getting too terrified to act because we are afraid of, you know, greenwashing claims, and then we go into a green hushing, yeah. and then we can look into I carbon love market. This new language. <laughs> I, I read about green hushing. The other day, yeah. That's good. Yeah, and, and then we are afraid, right? Like, let's look but at... But is that a real thing, do you think? Companies yes. just yes. saying... Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, 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 take all of, yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, fine, yeah. So yeah. Let, let's take carbon markets, right. right? There was this big scandal with Vera with the phantom credits oh, yeah, that they yeah. were selling, right? Oh, you know, and now everyone is afraid of the carbon yeah. markets. Yeah. But carbon market was there in the first place, the voluntary, so that we scale technologies to technologies or nature mm. um, to reduce carbon emissions, right? And we've heard yesterday from the climate scientists that we need to both reduce emissions and restore nature because it keeps us in balance. Now, with this, of, of course, there is a problem here. There were phantom credits, but for me, what is lacking in that case is not that the instrument is wrong and we shouldn't use it. We absolutely need to tackle finance and put uh, finance towards nature restoration. But maybe the transparency is the missing bit. And for example, that's what we are focusing with Earth Plus. We are restoring and cleaning soils and removing CO2. Mm. But we realize that we have to show transparently, like all the best NGOs do in those traditions of where action is taking place, what are the results of, of those actions. And we have, if we have this transparency in the carbon market space, we see the satellites, we see the pictures, we see the statistics, maybe then there would be also less place for greenwashing because we can see it with our own eyes as consumers of what's happening on the ground. You can't get away with it, Arlo. So, okay, so this green hushing, okay, fine. This is real, is it? Definitely, yeah, there's lots of... Um, I mean, it's bad if it's real, right? I mean, it's we, bad because, yeah. I, w I mean, I, I, it's urgent to go back to the point, the challenge is urgent and we need companies to take action. And uh, I think that at the moment, there is a palpable fear of companies communicating about this topic because they don't want to be bashed. And uh, 
that's a great shame. I really want to hear from companies that are taking action on this agenda. Um, I think if one observation I wanted to make was that we, we live in a world of misinformation. So if we thought that greenwash is a particular problem in the climate space, it, it's certainly not just isolated to the climate space. Everything we see and do these days is subject to misinformation. Post-truth. Um, yeah, exactly. Politics is the worst of all, of course. Mm. And I think that what is needed is we need to dial up the volume on companies talking about climate change and climate action, but we also need to dial up regulation and we also need to dial up scrutiny and dialogue. And I think that's that scrutiny and dialogue thing is more important than regulation personally because regulation is is dealing with laggards people that are you know the deliberate green one the people that are actually malicious. which i malicious which personally i don't think is the majority mm. i think one of the biggest challenges in this space is that there the, the traditional media land the demise of traditional media mm. has meant that there are far fewer people scrutinizing corporate claims than ever in my lifetime. So it's much easier now to say stuff and not have anybody analyze yeah. it in any particular way. You know, so I, I think that you have to have scrutiny at the same time as the volume. And, and I totally agree on the scrutiny, but I'm just wondering, as that increases, does it encourage the green hushing? I mean, the companies we want to hear from, because I think what's so important well, is to be open and honest and share experiences on in the efforts to tackle climate change? I, I think that you want to most hear companies that yeah. I deal with have a very conventional understanding of marketing and comms in the sense they think it's about broadcast. Yeah. And standing on a stage telling people something, yeah. when in reality, <laughs> a, a subject like climate yeah. is something that people want to communicate about. And communications is two way. There's got to be a feedback loop to that. So what people really want is dialogue. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the problem with the stuff that you're talking, you know, these adverts is that you mm -hmm. drive along the motorway and you see it and you can't respond. You can't mm -hmm. say, well, is that really true? Yeah. When I was coming into work this morning, there's a big advert across the middle of the road saying that Eurotunnel, go to Europe by Eurotunnel. Apologies if there's anyone from Eurotunnel here because it's, it's more efficient than taking the plane. And yeah. I, I thought, well, yeah, it depends what car you're driving, how far you're going, and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. I'm, I think it'll all yeah. these things. But so sure. there's no response mechanism to that with conventional forms of marketing. So that's a big challenge. So look, another thing which I think is, we've touched on a solitaire, you, you raised this, that you've, in your engagements, have moved past gloom and doom. Oh. You just do solutions. I mean, OK, I, I've made a career out of gloom and doom because I think, I think, I think we... <laughs> I mean, I'm actually an optimistic kind of guy, but I think in order to convey the science, I mean, I think the foundation for all of this is what the scientists tell us. Yeah. And you can sugarcoat that. You can sort of say, well, we'll leave them to get on with that, and we'll talk about this new gizmo over here that's nice and green. I mean, we had endless debates in the newsroom about this. Editors would beg me, can you at least give a little bit of a hint of a solution if you're telling us about the polar ice sheets melting and all these cities are going to get flooded. I mean, I always argued we need to share those projections with the public because they're real and they're grounded in proper peer-reviewed science. So you can't duck them. And, and there, there, aren't always, there aren't always neat solutions to things. They're polar melting, the only solution is to cut emissions. Uh, so how, how do you try to balance that? And we'll just hear from everybody. On so that. absolutely, we've got to communicate the science. And we've been doing that for 20 years. But the science, but, but, but the science has got stronger. The science has got stronger. Yeah. But do, to throw it back to you, do you think that communicating the science and the urgency overwhelmingly, we know it's overwhelming because when we ask the public if they yeah. hear more about the problems or the solutions to climate change, they overwhelming 80% plus say they hear about the problem. And when we ask them about the problem of climate change versus the solutions, they are much more able sure. to articulate the problem and the solution. Yeah. So what I'd say back to you is, has 20, 30 years of doubling down on the we're fucked message yeah. generated the change we need to see because I would say it has not and so it's yeah. not about 
talking less about the problem. It's about talking equally, if sure. not more, about the answers to it. We are now desperately in need of a solutions economy. We are desperately in need of these people. Everyone in this room is what I would call a solutionist. Book. Mm. Uh, 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 plug there. I read a book about it. Everybody in this room is who I would call a solutionist. These are the people who are actually dealing with that science, with that problem. So I, and we know as well that we have this terrifying fatalism amongst the young. Worldwide, at least one in five young people are now completely fatalistic about climate change. That it's not that they don't think that we could solve it, they just think we won't, we absolutely won't. I'll be honest, I'm more afraid of fatalism than I am of climate change. Climate change is just chemistry and we do have the solutions to it. But if we don't have young people, older people, business leaders who believe that the solutions are doable, practical and can articulate them, then we are screwed. So I, I have to say I am a... I, Whenever you say we need to talk about the solutions, we need to talk about the answers, we need to talk about the fixes, everyone seems to think it's an attack on talking about the science. It's like, no, 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 please talk no, about no, the no, science. But yeah. just mm. as much mm. talk about all of the answers that are out there in this room. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I, building on that, I think that um, I don't think we do need any many, much more science communications personally, because I think if you talk to ordinary people, people basically get that this is happening. The communications opportunity that I think that exists in this space is that there are solutions and the transformation is happening now. Yeah. So I've been in this space for 20 years and for 20 years I've been talking to people about the fact that, for example, our energy system is going to change. Of course, I've always been saying there's lots of interesting people, they've got cool technology, it's going to happen very soon. So it's happening right now. Today, it's fully underway. There's a massive transformation taking place. You know, the, 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 the fossil fuel dinosaurs are desperately clinging. They're still making money right now, but they will not be unless they transform fairly yeah. soon because there's a massive, large-scale transformation underway. I suspect that's one of the reasons for this event here today because the UK is behind the curve on this stuff look you know god we need that battery factory tomorrow from tata and so you know, we we need we've been clinging on to the old economy for far too long you know if we start talking to people about what's happening in china on renewables it's jaw dropping we, we and, and if you ask ordinary people about climate change what you the narrative that is stuck in their brains is the number of coal fired power stations that are being built in china when in fact they're contribution to solar and wind is unbelievable. So I think we need to talk more about the revolution that's happening now. It's happening in energy now. It's really at the tipping point in agriculture um, right now. And it, I could talk about yeah. other areas where that transformation is taking place. But so some people are motivated by being scared. Other people are motivated by opportunity and not wanting to be left off of the bandwagon. And the UK is sort of running behind <laughs> yeah. desperately. Th th there's a, perhaps another category in addition to that. I was talking to a guy running a, a fund and he said that many of his clients were very interested in, in climate change and actually were pretty well kind of understood it, you know, some of the, the, the key elements of it and the risks and so forth. But when Putin invaded Ukraine and oil and gas prices shot up, those same people who were quite well across the climate science, rang up my friend to say, you are getting me a slice of oil and gas shares, aren't you? These dividends, these returns, and all the rest of it. I and mean, that's another kind of, you know, people who were aware of the problem broadly, but just see some dollar signs ticking away in front of them. Eleanor, what do you want to say on this? Well, to be honest, it makes me upset, sad and a little bit angry that at this stage, with knowing all the science, we yeah. are still running against each other. We have, those running are the good guys, yeah. those are the bad guys. Yeah. We try to share something, we try, to, we try to fight. Well, in reality, we have to rise for the challenge and we have to work together. We have yeah. to collaborate. We don't have time to, to fight. Mm. We only have time to come together for solutions. And I think that is really important. And 
in terms of um, solutions, as solution is over here, we need to make it really simple to take action. Like, for example, we come to companies and we say, give us your lands or to cities, give us your lands that you don't use around your plants or unmanaged lands. We manage them for you. We remove your em these emissions for you. We create economy out of it. We need to make with all our solutions simplicity of action for politicians, for governments, for companies, for individuals, anyone out there. You want to make it easy. Exactly. Yeah. So I think uh, we've got this amazing room full here. Um, as we sort of enter the last, I don't know, few minutes of the, of the session, I, I, I don't know if it would be helpful for everybody here if this expert panel um, kind of came up with like one thing. It's quite journalistic, isn't it? One thing that, that perhaps might be helpful for everybody here in their conversations, where they work, the people they deal with, maybe back at home. Is, is there one insight? I mean, you've given us plenty, but one story, one anecdote. Tell you what, while you're pondering that, I've got one. I mean, I was talking to the top team of a really big company, and there was a bit of opposition to this agenda from the chief financial officer. Really quite awkward. And I, I realized I wasn't cutting through at all till I told the story of what happened in Durban in South Africa last April, when a big bad storm flooded the port and completely wrecked the railway and the road leading to the port. So all the traffic that was coming down from southern Africa to Durban couldn't get loaded onto the ships. Foremost among them, the world's largest supply of cobalt, mined in Democratic Republic of Congo, brought down to Durban, stuck onto ships going to China. Because that supply route was shut for a month, every component that uses cobalt went up in price. And at that moment, I thought, I've got you, CFO, because the penny dropped. It suddenly made sense. And I said, if you look at the climate projections, we're going to get more extreme weather of exactly the type that shut the port of Durban. That's mine. Um, Eleanor. Well, for me... Send them away with, with one story that they can all... I mean, of course, the Ice River we all love. That's a great one. Well, this one is going to be from Simon Sinek. I loved his input. Um, I watched his training and he said, we need to communicate like we are talking to truck drivers. Because if a truck driver understands us, then a scientist will understand us too. And that's the key in terms of simplicity and that's the key in terms of getting the message across of whatever we are doing, trying to communicate the urgency or trying to showcase the solution. Okay, very good. Arlo? Um, I think that there's a lot of lessons from the public health space that you can apply to, to, to climate action. So I think it's well worth, if you're interested in this space, looking. smoking is a great one to look at the case study in terms of how progress has been made. And by the way, we've known that smoking has been very damaging to human health for a very long time, and it's taken a long time to take action to, for people to take action not because they didn't know it was bad for them bad for them themselves as an individual person mm. not you know looking miles away at someone who lives near the arctic L literally that's bad for you and it took a long time to get to that point so i think the le the, the lesson that we can take from that is there are ways of moving people one, one way of moving people is to regulate uh, is to regulate and put down rules and tell people what they need to do and the other way is to incentivize people if we put a big sign up there saying, you know, uh, free, you know, chance to win a Tesla Model Y, one in 10 chance at the back, everyone will be out pretty quick, right? And that, so yeah. you've got to incentivize people, you've got to make people feel left out. And as I say, this is a massive transformation that's happening right now. So people, if they're not engaged in this space, should feel left out. So what would I be communicating in this? But I'd be trying to communicate the idea that this is a super exciting space to be for a career, for a company, whatever, for, for whatever it might be. And you need to, you're left out if you're not participating yeah. in it. Yeah, yeah. In some way. Fun. They're definitely plus oneing on simplicity and definitely one plus oneing on selling the benefits rather than the fear. Um, late last year, I was asked to speak to a group of about 45 essentially kids 
um, about climate change and how to talk about climate change. Uh, we spent a day with them, trying to find their voice, etc. Really interesting work. They were all social media influencers. And at the end of the day, and I, I did this for YouTube, at the end of the day, YouTube told me that that group of kids have a daily reach of a billion. Those 40 kids talk to a billion people every single day. So um, from a professional communicator to you guys, as an industry, we are moving so online and so much around social media influencers because the power to change attitudes and behaviors in those platforms are so much bigger than any platform we've ever had before. And in fact, new Unilever research shows that people, are, uh, three quarters of people are more likely to listen to and act on advice and insights and behaviors if they come from a social media influencer than if they come from the news, if they come from TV, if they come from um, business. So that's why I'm so pleased we've got Elena on the stage. Um, but if I had one piece of advice of where to spend your marketing budget, spend it on working with social media influencers because the bang for your buck is gonna be so much bigger. That's a great point and I'm really, really pleased uh, that you brought it up because we haven't done enough on it. And just as a final point from me, picking up on Arlo's point, I sometimes find what does resonate is telling the story of my great-great-grandfather who ran away to sea and uh, was a seafarer for all of his life and lived through the transition from sail to steam. And he described Amazing. how painful it was yeah. for all of those mariners who'd grown up with sails, the romance of the ocean, hauling on the ropes and all the rest of it, uh, confronted now with the prospect of loading coal into a boiler and, and getting a steamship to, uh, to operate, which obviously took over and did better. And my, my ancestor describes in his memoirs, which by the way are appalling because they're all about how marvelous he was, but, but there's this one bit I love, which he says, it was very clear to him very early on in the transition that there'd be winners and yeah. there'd be losers. Yeah. Those who didn't recognize that there was a transition quickly went bust. Yes. Those who recognized, as Arlo describes, that we are in the middle of this amazing upheaval with incredible opportunities made their fortune. Would you join me in thanking this fantastic panel? I've really loved it. <laughs> really, really good. Um, I hope we sent you away with some brilliant ideas. You're all going to communicate the challenge with huge effectiveness and things will change. It's lunch now. Uh, the next session begins at 2 o'clock and uh, Alistair Drennan will be uh, in the hot seat. Thank you all very much indeed. Take care. Well, great. Brilliant. Hi there to everyone at Innovation Zero. Ben Ainsley here, driver and co-owner of the Emirates Great Britain Cell GP team. It's great to see London and the wider international community coming together to push the needle on sustainability and green innovation. CLGP is the first climate positive sports and entertainment property. I hope you have an excellent two days at Innovation Zero.